Alonzo really want to talk about this movie. So we're talking about this movie. It's called <laughs> I've Heard the Mermaid Singing. I had never even heard of this movie before you suggested it. So tell us about it. This is a movie I saw in college. One of the first queer films I think I ever saw and one that really made an impact on me just because it was at that moment in my life where I was sort of first discovering art house cinema on my own. And I don't know if I saw this on like Siskel and Ebert or what, but I had heard about this movie and saw it several times and was a big fan of it. Hello. My name is Polly Vandersma, and I'm a Girl Friday. Uh, Patricia Rosema, who's gone on to make a lot of really cool stuff, including uh, Mansfield Park. Um, this is one of her, I think, maybe her first feature. And so, yeah, the Kino Lorber has a new 4K restoration. It is currently screening in New York at the Metrograph. And I think you can also digitally uh, watch it on their, their virtual marquee. And then it opens this Friday the 18th at the Alamo in Los Angeles. It stars Sheila McCarthy as a young woman named Polly sort of directionless, doesn't quite know what she's doing. She she works as a temp, as a person Friday. But as she mentions at the beginning, she was told by someone that she was um, organizationally impaired. She winds up getting a job uh, working for a gallery for a woman that she refers to as the curator. And um, she is smitten by the curator and sort of swept up in this world of art and, you know, fancy talk. And, uh, you know, she likes to take photographs on the side, but when she anonymously submits her photographs to the curator, she gets a blistering uh, put down of her work. Meanwhile, she's helping the curator get her own paintings out in the world, or are they? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sort of learns about life and, and figures out her stuff in a lot of ways that I find really charming. I also think that Quentin Tarantino totally stole a thing from this movie for Pulp Fiction, which is that the curator's paintings, you never see them. They're just frames around light. And so rather than having showing us actual art for us to go, oh, well, that's not very good. It's just these l l lights in frames. So when people are going, oh my God, this is amazing art, you have to sort of mentally add that yourself. So the briefcase in Pulp Fiction, mm -hmm. I think is a lift from the, 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 the art in this movie. I've never heard anybody ask him, so I'll never ask. He would probably have seen this though. It came out in yes. 1987, you yes. know, and he of course sees everything. Um, so a little of this character goes a long way. Okay. And if she is your cup of tea, you'll have a really, really good time. I think watching her through all of her adventures. If you find her like twee and adorable, like you can imagine <laughs> her having her own series on Fox, right? Right, but you know, I think in 1987, maybe we hadn't we hadn't been given Adorkable and the Manic Pixie Dream Girl, or a lot of these. Not that she's that, but like those 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 kind of tropes hadn't really been crammed down our throats right. yet. She's so, manic and a pixie, though, for sure. She is. She's she's very awkward and very shy, and and I think to a very funny extent. Like I, I love the Japanese restaurant scene. I mm -hmm. feel like that is just there's just like one physical or like awkward verbal thing after another, and it's just you feel for her because she's completely out of her element and just just screwing it up so badly. Right. So yeah, there's a, there's a subtle physical comedy going on here, but then there are these really whimsical flights of fancy that are all yes. her fantasy world of, of being brilliant and verbose and saying the most clever thing at the right time. And, and I, or again, being able to fly. <laughs> yeah. And those feel to me repetitive. And again, a little bit of that idea goes a long way. Like it's a lot of this is so twee and adorable that I found it a little grating until it became about something serious, until mm. it takes a turn okay, and becomes about something much more substantial and thoughtful. And maybe because we have a set up to believe that this is going to be a light, sweet comedy that we mm. get lulled in. Maybe that's the, the brilliance of it. That's the cleverness of it, that it lulls you into thinking that this is one kind of story. And then it takes a turn and becomes much more serious as she gets more entangled with the curator and her girlfriend right. and what's really, really going on here. Um, so maybe that was by design, right? To make well you think that she's a simpleton yeah, I mean, the title is meant to reference, you know, uh, T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So it's about somebody who is kind of a non-entity, somebody who people ignore and look over. And you're following that character as, yes, yeah, she has this sort of inner fantasy life, but she's sort of bumbling her way through her actual life. And then as the film takes a turn, it sort of forces her to kind of take inventory of herself and her own capabilities and sort of like understand 
what's, you know, who, who, who's the authority here and who's to be believed about, you know, my talent. And does it matter what anybody says about this art? If this, if doing this art makes me happy, you know, um, I don't know for, for me, it really works. And obviously it is one of those things in this, uh, this is my space jam. Okay. I saw it when I was younger and I thought it was really cool and I still have a very soft spot in my heart for it. There's one brilliant scene where the curator and is it an art critic? They yes. are talking about <laughs> no, a piece a of art, and they're going back and forth, like one one upping each other with the most arrogant <laughs> critic speak. It is all gobbledygook nonsense, and they're just talking around and through each other and trying to one up each other with how brilliant they are. And that is dead on. I think what a lot of us do <laughs> my, 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 in various my walks of life. <laughs> my favorite line is New York is mad for his oblique pragmatism. <laughs> <laughs> That whole scene's amazing. And but from that point on, though, it takes a turn and becomes a little more analytical and a little more critical. And I liked it from that point on. Um, and it's so 80s in the look of it, the hair sure. and the yeah. score and like the lamps, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, it, it is a very synthy score, which was very common as sort of a, a low budget fix for, for indie films of that period. Yeah, it, it is it is dated. It is of its moment. I love this character. I, I love her awkwardness. And I love that over the course of the film, she kind of finds her footing and finds her voice. And that, you know, they're there and they're the way that that manifests visually as well as in this in the story I, I think is really delightful i love sheila mccarthy's performance so i i was excited to hear about this and i wanted to talk about it uh, i'm sorry you thought, thought it was twee but no, I'm, no. Glad, I'm glad that we're i'm glad that we're talking about it no i had never heard of this so i'm thrilled to have learned about a new film from you so thank you for that our numbers are going to be really really disparate <laughs> you are saying what is yours i gave it a nine <laughs> i'm saying five okay. so our number is a seven 